Hi, welcome to our first episode of Innovation Through Autodesk Simulation. My name is Dave May. And I'm Brian Zayas. Well, today, we're going to be going through a design process for a frame that's going to be supporting a robotic arm. That's right. Let's take a quick look in Inventor here. Now, what we're doing is actually outlining the pedestal, if you will, that we need to design with a volume. And what you can see is that we really only have an idea of the rough shape of this frame. And so we need to create a frame or a support system that's safe, cost effective, and also meets performance requirements. What you'll notice with Frame Generator is that we can take all the standard cross sections, apply them to the edges of my boundary part, and actually create a initial design right off the bat. What cross section do I use? How do I know? Do I use 2x2, two 4x4, two, 6x6 four four, six six steel? What thickness? Well, that's a great question, Brian. Now, when you come into any type of design, it's usually an iterative process, right? So a lot of times we're going to have several alternative designs or competing ideas. Now, using simulation is going to allow you to predict your product performance right. more accurately, more quickly, which is going to allow you to innovate better and choose the best option. Well, we already said we want it to be safe. So how can we quantify safety of our frame? Well, what's typically used is called factor of safety. Okay. Right? So that's a comparison between the stress in the frame to the yield stress of the material. Okay. Now, for this so, design, we're going to use a factor safety of three or higher. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So basically, the stress of the material versus the strength gives us our factor of safety. It's going to have to be able to withstand that weight with A, not yielding, and we'll judge that by factor of safety, and B, it can't deflect more than a certain amount. So for this project, we've been given the, the driver from our boss that it has to be a deflection of less than a tenth of an inch. And we talk about the weight of a robot. What we're talking about is really the static loading on the frame. Later on in episode two, we're going to get into dynamics, where we might see how an impulse from reaction force could amplify the stress and deformations in our entire system. So I'm going to make a simple level of detail in my inventor model that only has the system of interest before I go to my add-ins menu and hit that little mesh button up there. Now, as soon as you do hit that mesh button, what it's going to do is open up Autodesk Simulation. Now, one of the first things that you're going to see when it opens up is it's going to ask you what type of analysis you want to run. Right, and we can see that that's a lot of analysis types. Uh, where do we start? In this case, we just want to do a static analysis, right? And we're going to use linear assumptions for that. We'll talk a little bit about what that means in a second here. So we'll go ahead and choose that, and we can just press OK. Tell me about the red, because the red is, is always bad. And it's basically telling me that part one, two, three, my whole tree, my element type, material, definition, they're all undefined. So how do I set all those up automatically? Well, that's a good question. Now, all you have to do is generate the mesh okay. on this model, and it's automatically going to set the element type, definition, and if you've defined it in Inventor, it will read the material data at that point. Now that it's done meshing, let's take a look at what it created. Now, it looks like these are, are, are square elements, but there's also some triangles in there. Tell me a little bit more about what type of elements it's using and then why. Sure. So the simulation mesher by default is using what's called a hybrid mesh or a mixed okay. element mesh. All right. right. So what this is going to do is it's going to put what we call brick elements, which are the you know, kind of square elements, everywhere that it can. But when it approaches curved areas or areas where there are a number of different features coming together, it gets a little bit more difficult to represent that with a simple square. Okay, so what it does is it breaks that down into other elements. So there's a wedge which has six points, or a pyramid which is, think about it, kind of similar to that tet we saw earlier, but it would have a square base, square right? like, like a pyramid. So we have, in terms of solid elements, we have four different types, and so that means that simulation has the ability and the flexibility to go along and choose what's best for the given geometry. Now, there's a few areas here that look like they're a little bit deformed. Um, now, if I go up here to my display bar, it looks like I can choose and I can toggle between this button that says CAD and then these other display modes. Uh, so it looks like the CAD model would be my original geometry that's coming right, from Inventor. As, as imported from Inventor. As imported, okay. And the other ones are just different ways of visualizing uh, the mesh. Mm -hmm. 
what we'll probably want to do is, you know, just verify that everything was defined properly in our tree. Okay. Right? So we can go ahead and look on the left, and everything looks okay at the top, but what we probably want to do is kind of collapse this down to get more of an overall view of things. That's right. Like, in, like an inventor. We've dug into a subassembly, and now we want to collapse it all and get back to the top. Exactly. So go ahead and click in the tree, and then just choose, or press Control shift m Control on your Awesome. That is a pro tip right there. Sure is. Now, okay, now that I do that, I get the overall picture of my model. There are still four uh, red X's, and if I highlight those, looks like it's referring to these weld beads down here. That's right. Now, the welds put in in Inventor as weldments actually do import to your simulation. Right? Now, they're going to be placed as the weld was put on, so if you put a series of beads on at once, it will come in as one part. In this case, there were four different series of welds put on. Okay, that makes sense. But they do need materials to find because in Inventor they're just features, right? They're not actually parts. That's great. Now, when we're talking about welds, there's several ways we can handle them with FEA. One of them is to keep them in the model and apply to them sufficient materials. Uh, and, and one assumption that you can make is that the weld material is going to be the same strength and same flexibility as the base material. Now that really depends on what kind of steel you're using, what kind of electrode you're using, the welding process, but for now, let's just go ahead and pick these and assign steel. Now another simplification we've made is we haven't actually added photorealistic welds to the entire assembly. You can notice here that we've actually left off the groove welds that ultimately will connect the, a lot of this tube structure. Now that's conservative because if you think about it, this thing is gluing together in the model wherever we have coincident faces. Right. And if I only have two of my four sides of my tube touching, that's going to be pretty conservative. We need, we need to set up some boundary conditions here. We sure do. So what, what exactly is a boundary? I hear this all the time, boundary. What is a boundary condition? Well, a boundary condition is just a way to constrain the model, right? Kind of keep this frame from flying off into space. Now, I know in reality you just put a load on something. It's, it's sitting on the floor, right? Right. But the simulation software doesn't know that. Maybe it is actually in space. You know, so we're going to have to go ahead and put some boundaries on this. Okay, so there's several types of boundaries. The first thing that I'm going to do is, is select where this thing is held in real life. And if you think about this, this thing is bolted into a concrete floor, into right. some anchors. So it makes sense to probably select uh, the faces that are going to be held by the bolt. So you can see in my selection filter, again using that, I've selected surfaces and I've selected the single point select. So now I know that as I go around my circular edges and I select them, I know exactly what I'm grabbing. Right. So I've selected all four bolt holes and I'm going to right click and add a boundary condition. Now tell me a little bit more. What, what are these uh, TX, RX, what, what does this mean? We're looking at this point at the actual degrees of freedom, right? So we talked a little bit earlier about elements and how they have degrees of freedom at all the points or nodes. Now, what you're doing here is you can choose to constrain individual degrees of freedom if you can say, hey, this isn't going to move in the x direction, this isn't going to move in the y direction, or you can just choose some of the predefined sets off to the side. Okay, so this makes sense. So fixing it, it's check marking TX, TY, TZ, translation. So thinking back to our element, it's just going to make sure that those are held. Exactly. And in fact, what it's doing mathematically is just setting that answer to zero. Right. So, so it knows it's not moving. Right, which actually does you know, it's making it easier for it to solve, too. So that's where it's going to be restrained. Now, how about actually applying the force? And again, we talked earlier about this being a 2,000 pound robot. Sure. So should I just apply a surface force pushing normal to my frame of 2,000 pounds? Well, probably not. Okay. Right? If you think about it, in reality, we probably only have contact in certain areas on this frame, right? So first, we're going to want to make sure we can apply the load to those surfaces. Okay. And Th secondly, we're going to want to make sure it's applied from the center of gravity of that robot arm. Inside Inventor, what I want to do is actually use the split command in my part environment to make the faces smaller. Because when I apply a boundary condition, I usually want to pick a face that the force or the restraint is going to be applied to. So what I'm doing here in Inventor is simply converting a sketch representing where the outline of the robot will mount, and I'm using that to split the actual frame member into two faces. 
if you want to create a smaller area on which to apply a force, then simply create a sketch and then use the split command at the part level. Now, Dave also brought up a good point, is that I'm going to make a small face where the robot mounts, but also it's not as simple as applying a 2,000 pound force. I actually have this giant massive robot that sure. somewhere in space has a one point center of gravity, where if we wanted to simplify that robot into a single point, that one point would represent the mass. Now, first thing we're going to need to know is where is that center of gravity or center of mass for that robot arm? Of course, inside Inventor, all we're going to do is switch to the right level of detail. In this case, what I've done is I've suppressed the frame and I've activated just the robot. Now, in my assembly eye properties, what I'm able to do is quickly discern what the center of gravity location is and the overall mass. So again, another reason we want to make sure and apply our materials in Inventor so we know exactly where the CG is going to be. And I hit this button, copy to clipboard. So now I have the coordinates of the center of mass of my robot. So now that we've split the part in Inventor, we'll go back into simulation and let's actually apply this remote load. Now, we know where we're going to apply the remote load to. We have the coordinates of where the load is. So what we need to do in simulation is actually create a point where that center of gravity is. All I'm going to do is go to my geometry menu, add, and do the point type in the coordinates that I just copied from my clipboard, and boom, we now have a point inside of our model that represents the center of gravity of this robot. We can now connect this CG back to the frame. And like we were talking about earlier, it's cost. It costs every time we mesh something. So I don't want to just have a robot in there that I'm not going to be solving for, because I don't have to sure. mesh that, elements, bricks, wedges. There's no point in doing that. And what we're going to do to set this remote load up is choose all the surfaces where we want the load to be attached to. Okay. Okay, so these are the surfaces we split out in Inventor, right? And we're going to go ahead and choose those surfaces, right click, and go to Create Remote Load. Okay. All right. Now it's important that your model is already meshed at this point. Okay. The reason for that is because this remote load is actually going to create a series of lines attaching the points on the mesh to this point in space. So best practice, generate the mesh right away, and then go ahead and set up the rest of the model. Sure. Now back to this remote load. Yeah. What we want to do is go ahead and choose that point where we would like the load to be applied, our point in space, and choose, and then say set load location. All right? At that point, we can go ahead and enter a part number. Now, this may be a little confusing at first, but again, what we're going to be doing here is creating a bunch of lines, right? We're creating elements to connect this point in space to the rest of our geometry, okay? So we can choose kind of any part number you want for this. Uh, I recommend making a part number that's sufficiently high yeah. enough. Yeah, I just go with 200, not, for example. Exactly. Mm -hmm. sure. We don't have 200 frame members here, so that's fine. So let's just say 200, and then we can go ahead and click Generate Load Elements. Now, at that point, you can say add load and choose any of a variety of different loads or boundaries to add there. Now we're going to add what's called a lumped mass. Absolutely, because we have a 2,000 pound lumped robot mass here. Sure. Now, we could have just added a force pushing down there, right? Well, it's going to be a little bit different. And when we start talking about modal analysis or frequency analysis, there's a big difference between applying a force to something and actually having a lumped mass at the end of a system. So lump mass is more representative of what we're trying to accomplish here, and we'll talk more about that when we get to frequency.